the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. And I want us to consider Daniel, a man committed to God. Daniel, a man who lived an uncompromising life. Daniel, God's man for a time of crises. Daniel was a man who gave his life to the Lord and a man who was used by God in a tremendous way. Read with me Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 this morning. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought them, the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of the officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youth in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence, and every branch of wisdom endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had the ability for serving in the king's court, and he ordered them to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated for three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them were the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Meshach, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel he assigned the name Balthazar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But God made up his mind, but Daniel made up his mind, that he might not defile himself with a king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid for my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. Why they would see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who am of your age. Then you would make me forfeit my head. But Daniel said to the overseer, the commander of the officials, had appointed over Meshach, Kenaniah, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days, and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for this wonderful passage of Daniel. Pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes, that we might see Daniel, the kind of man that was uncompromising, the character that he had, that he was committed to you, the man that you would use for your honor and glory. Bless our time together. We pray that you would help us to understand. We pray for Dr. Montoya that you would allow him to get better, Father, that he might be able to join us next week, Father. May you be glorified, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel, a man committed to God, a man who lived an uncompromising life. Daniel, a man for a time of crisis. We see right here that Daniel, this young man who was probably a young teenager, 14 through 17 years of age, that he was taken captive from his homeland into a foreign kingdom, Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan society, an ancient Hollywood, if you would. Daniel was taken on the first deportation. There were three deportations, and King Nebuchadnezzar took the best on the first deportation, and Daniel and his three friends were amongst those that were taken. Now, it is God who allowed this to take place. It is God who had warned Judah over and over, and they disobeyed. And before God judges, he warns. Before God judges, he always warns his people. Turn with me to Jeremiah, for example. In Jeremiah chapter 2, I want us to consider this passage here. The prophet Jeremiah was sent to warn God's people. And in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 13, this is what he says. 
He says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now turn over to chapter 3 and verse 10. Again, it says, in spite of... Of all this, her treacherous sister, Judah, did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. And again, we see in chapter 5 of Jeremiah, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Look at 20. Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim in Judah, saying, Now hear this, O foolish and senseless people. Who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble in my presence? For I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea, an eternal decree, so it cannot cross over it. Though the waves toss, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot cross over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives the rain in its seasons, both autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. So we see that God has warning Judah over and over, and they continue to disobey. And before God judges, he warns. So we see in Daniel chapter 1, that God has warned, and they have continued. So we see that God allows Nebuchadnezzar to enter and beseech the city, to beseech Zuda, to so that they would sense his discipline, and they take the best out of that wonderful nation. Now, one of the things that's important is to see that this man, Daniel, was a young man, a man who served God in that location for well over 70 years. But God knew that Daniel was that kind of man for a time of crisis. Daniel knew the Lord before he was taken into captivity. Daniel prayed to God. Daniel honored God. He worshiped the Lord. Daniel had a relationship with God. And so when God took him from this location and placed him in this ancient Hollywood, Daniel was ready to continue to serve God. And the Lord knew that. Daniel was committed. Daniel was uncompromising. Daniel would not give in. Daniel did not have a price. Daniel could not be bought. Daniel stood firm. And where the law of God stood, Daniel stood. He put a, a, a if you would, in the sand, he drew a line. What God's word says, this is what I'll do. I will not violate the word of God. And so Daniel was a man, if you would, who trusted God, who was committed to God, who was not compromising. Friends, we live in a time and age when everybody compromises. And we see that all around us. We see it in our leadership. We see it outside the churches. But friends, sometimes we see it within the church as well. People giving in to those pressures from around and we compromise what we know to be wrong we do instead of doing what is right. And so we see this man who was sold out. And when a person determines in his mind to live and is committed and sold out and uncompromising in a pagan society, there is a sequence of characteristics that take place in the person's life. And I want us to see that this morning. Because Daniel illustrates better than anyone else a man who will not compromise, a man who will stand firm, a man who will not give in to the pressures around us, regardless of the cost. And let me say this, friends, there is a cost, okay? There is a price to pay. And Daniel knew that, that his life in the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar was meaningless. He could kill them right there on the spot. But he's trusting God. And you and I, as God's people, need to learn to trust him because he's in control of our lives and he will oversee everything that happens. But I want us to consider this morning some characteristics that I see that illustrate and we see in the life of Daniel that I think will help us. We're coming to the end of this year. 
And soon we're going to start a brand new year, the Lord willing, 2021. And as we consider these, that you would look at your life and look at Daniel's life. Many people say, well, Daniel was special, but the same God that Daniel served is the same God that we serve today. Amen? The same God who rules the heavens and the earth. And the way God used Daniel, he can use you and I for his honor and for his glory. And I want us to see in verse 8, it says here, but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with a king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now, the first characteristic that I want us to take note in the life of this young man, and by the way, he is a young man, an amazing thing that a young person at the age of 14, 15, 16 can have this kind of commitment. So if you're 14 or you're 80, it doesn't matter. You can have the same commitment that Daniel had. It takes your heart to want to do it, to purpose, not to defile yourself. So the first thing I want us to consider in verse 8 is that Daniel had a committed and unashamed boldness. He was bold. Look at what he says in verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with a king's choice food and with the wine. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Daniel purposed in his heart. And this is fascinating. Here's an unashamed boldness. He was bold. He didn't hee-haw around. He spoke the truth. And he told the commander, tell the king that I am not going to eat or partake of his food or wine. He didn't think twice. I like that boldness, friends. I think we need men that are bold today. We need people that are bold, that are committed to God, that are willing to speak the truth, that are willing to say no when something is wrong. And that was the kind of man that Daniel was. I mean, you're telling the king and his food is defiled. He's telling the king, your food is defiled and it will defile me. And friends, that's pretty bold stuff. I love the kind of boldness. He didn't con the king or the prince of the eunuchs. He didn't try to wiggle out of that. We might do that. How many times have you been in a situation that is really a spiritual issue? And we give a reason other than a reason, spiritual reason to get out of it. We go along with it. We compromise. We don't speak the truth. For whatever the reason, we're ashamed. We don't have this kind of boldness. And friends, what is needed in the church to say is men and women that are bold, that are not ashamed of the word of God. Young people that will take a stand. We live in a generation where our youth is pursuing things. They're looking for something to fill the emptiness in their life. And they try to fill it with drugs and sex and material things. And it doesn't satisfy. And you here, myself, we have the word of God. And young people, the world needs other young youth to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not to be ashamed. Our universities are filled with people who are pursuing the wrong things. And maybe you're in a university right now. You're on Zoom. But soon you'll go back next year, that you might go back with a newness of, I need to be bold. You that work in a secular work right now, maybe you're not working because you can't, but soon you'll go back. You who have many relatives, but right now you can't visit them due to the COVID-19, but soon you may. That God will give you and I boldness to live the life, to proclaim the truth, and not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We need that today, friends. We need people that have that kind of boldness. And so we see right here that Daniel, at the age of 14 or 15, has character. And he's telling the king, I cannot eat. It, it will defile me. An unashamed boldness goes with an uncompromising life. When you don't compromise and you're bold, they go hand in hand. You're not going to do anything that will defile you. You draw the line where the word of God says it's wrong, and you do it. 
You don't go beyond that. But Daniel had that kind of character, an unashamed boldness. And so he tells the king, it'll defile me. And something that defiles, it says in the Old Testament, is, a, is an abomination to the Lord. What the king was asking him to do was in violation of God's law. And isn't it wonderful that when somebody in the midst of a tough situation is not ashamed to speak the truth of a commitment to the Lord's word. This is the final authority and the only authority. Every issue in life, if the word of God says it's wrong, guess what? It's wrong. If the word of God says it'll defile you, guess what? It'll defile you. And so we need to see that. And we live by the book. Daniel was that kind of man. He didn't hee-haw around. He stood firm in the face of this king in, the, in this massive pagan ancient Hollywood that he was in. Everything under the sun was there. But Daniel had his eyes on the Lord. And friends, you and I keep to, have to keep our eyes on the Lord all the time and remove those things that will defile you and I. That's real character. Friends, real character, real compromising character. He wasn't ashamed of God. He wasn't ashamed of his faith. Even in the midst of a pagan society, even though he was a prisoner of the king, even though the king had the right to kill him for disobedience or rebellion, it never phased his commitment. He looked at the prince of the eunuch, didn't think twice. Tell the king, I am not going to compromise by eating his food and wine that has been offered to idols. I'm not going to do it. And he stood his ground in spite of what the cost might have been. And friends, let me say this. There's always a cost, okay? There's always a cost. It cost our Lord. He went to the cross for it. There's always a cost. And the Lord told his disciples that they would be persecuted. That will happen. But you and I continue to have this boldness in the midst of this pagan. Let me say this. When you and I are bold about our relationship to God, it really makes a difference in those people that are not saved. They see you, and they see your life, and they see what you're saying, and they begin to think, wait a minute. And you, it provokes their thinking when you share the gospel. And many of them may come to Jesus Christ and give them their lives. But it takes you and I to be bold. Go with me to Daniel chapter 6. Right there in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. We see a, a situation here that I think will help us understand. When he was told that he wasn't allowed to pray, look what Daniel did. The king told him, you cannot pray. Did Daniel listen? No. Daniel honored his God. And it says right here in Daniel chapter 6, starting with verse 1. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom and over them three commissioners of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. And then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to the government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in them. Then these men said, we will find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. So they're going to try to find some accusation. So they go to the king and they feel, make a decree that everybody has to bow to him, to his God. And obviously Daniel becomes aware of that. Now look at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. 
And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying, giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Friends, that didn't bother him. You cannot pray anymore. Okay, he goes up to the roof, opens the window. Everybody can see him. See, he was bold. He prayed to God. Friends, when you know the true and living God, you're not going to pray to any other false god. And Daniel wasn't about to do that. He's going to worship the true and living God. And so right there in front of everyone, he goes up and he worships the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Psalm 40. Tremendous passage that kind of goes along with this. In Psalm 40, verse 8. Verses 8 through 10. Psalm 40, verses 8 through 10. And this is what the psalmist says. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord. You know, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. Daniel, David, they were not ashamed to proclaim the word of God. He says right here in verse 9, I have proclaimed the glad tidings of righteousness. I have proclaimed the good news. I have proclaimed, if you would, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was not ashamed in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips. When you have God in your heart, how can you not proclaim? How can you not tell others of Jesus Christ? And right here we see that. Turn with me to Psalm 71. In Psalm 71, we see again the psalmist saying this. In Psalm 71 and verse 15. The psalmist says, Psalm 71 and verse 15. Here we go. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long. For I do not know the sum of them. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. It's an amazing thing. The psalmist is saying right here, my mouth shall tell of your righteousness. There's a boldness, unashamed boldness that you have to speak the truth. The world is in need of the truth. The world is perishing before our eyes. And you and I, as a people of God, have the truth. For us to keep it to ourselves will be neglect of duty, friends. We have an obligation to this generation. Young people, you have an obligation to your generation to proclaim the gospel, not to be ashamed to tell others about Jesus Christ. And as you begin to live for him as Daniel did, people begin as David did. People begin to take note. There's something different about this man. There's something different about this woman. There's something different about this young lady. What is it? It's Christ in you. And you're able to share with them what God has done for you. But if you're ashamed and timid of the gospel, how will they hear? How will they know? How can they be saved? It's until you and I share the good news with them that they can hear of the wonderful grace and forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that as we come to the end of this year and next year, you will say, Lord, I want to be bold. I want to share. I want to have this unashamed boldness, not to argue with people, not to come down on people, but to tell them what God has done for us, to give them a testimony uh, to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to wherever you find yourself, to take tracks and hand them out and to tell others of the wonderful love of Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, we have another wonderful passage that speaks of this. In Psalm 119 and verse 46. 
Again, the same theme. He says, I will speak of your testimonies before kings, and I shall not be what? Ashamed. I will speak. Friend, we cannot be ashamed of anyone. If it's the president, we share the gospel with them. If it's the governor, whoever it is, regardless of their position, we cannot be ashamed. If anyone needs the gospel, it's some of these men who have compromised and are living a life that is not honoring to God. And they're in place of position. Don't ever be intimidated by the world, friends. Don't ever be ashamed of the gospel. If Jesus is real in your heart, how can you not, from the heart flows the issues that come up that the Lord is real in our lives, amen? How can you hold back if the Lord is real? Well, the Lord was real in Daniel's life. The Lord was real in David's life. And I pray that the Lord is real in your life, that you will have this kind of boldness. Go to Acts chapter 4. I love this. In the book of Acts chapter 4, we see his apostles here. Same theme, this boldness. They're not ashamed. Chapter 4. And look at verse 1 of Acts chapter 4. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming, in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of them came to be about 5,000. Oh, friends, they took a stand. They proclaimed. Go with me to verse 18. Because we see what happens to them. Whenever you take a stand... You know, we're at the point where the pressure is all around us. To stop proclaiming the word of God. Talk about anything, but in some countries, that's what they tell you to do. Communist China. They, were, they told their pastors, you can preach, but make sure you lift up the communist government. Or else we'll take the preaching away from you. What do you do when you're in that position? You continue to preach knowing what can happen to you? We're getting to that point in our own nation, friends. And the church needs to step up and be unashamed and fearless and continue to teach and preach the word of God. It's the only word that will change a life, friends. Nothing else. On the contrary, we see man getting worse and worse, isn't he? Becoming more and more evil. It's the word of God that enters the heart of a man and begins to change him from inside outside. And he becomes a new creation in Jesus Christ. And we have the message. But right here in verse 18, it says, And when they summoned them, that is his apostles, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen or heard. They took a stand, friends. We may get to that point. Years ago, I was working for the city of L.A. And I would take my Bible and I would put it on my desk. And it was a pretty good sized one. And I had a friend who was a believer. He was a Christian too. But he took his little tiny Bible about this big. put it. He was like one of those secret spy Christians, you know. I don't want anybody. A secret agent. And I put my Bible there. And he came over and he said, you know, there might come a time when they're going to tell you you can't bring the Bible to work. And I, I never thought of that. But you know, it's coming to that point. It's come to that point where they may say, we don't want the word of God here. It's come to that point where you cannot talk about God or you would be, or be, get yourself in trouble. But as believers, we're going to continue to do that. Amen? 
I praise God for our pastors that preach the word of God with boldness every Sunday that are not ashamed of the gospel, that do not compromise in the word of God. And some have given in to compromising because of the pressures around us. Oh, may that never happen to us. May that never happen to you. May you continue to be bold proclaiming the good news. Now, Daniel had this character that stands fearlessly and boldly and unashamedly before kings, and he speaks the truth. Second characteristic I want us to see this morning back in Daniel chapter 1 that I think will help us as we consider our lives. Second, I believe commitment to God will result in a standard that is uncommon. A standard that is uncommon. You know, people who have an uncompromising life just don't do it the way everybody else does it. In verse 8, it says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with a king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the official that he might not defile. Now, that wasn't required of him. But he wants to be above. You have those that are bold, have an uncommon standard. It's above the rest. They fly with the, over with the eagles, not with the ducks or the pigeons down here. You know what I'm saying? They soar with the eagles above. They have a standard. And it's uncommon. People who make that kind of commitment always want to live at the highest plane. They don't just go along because everyone else is. No, they want to be above and beyond. They seem to have a deeper commitment to studying the Word of God. They seem to have a deeper commitment to prayer. They have a deeper commitment to do things the way they're supposed to be done. That's just the way they are. They're uncommon. Daniel was that kind of a man. We need to be that kind of people. They set their standard a cut above the masses, even a cut above Christians, friends. Even above other Christians that are half in, half out, that don't have that commitment. They don't live on that normal plane. Their standard exceeds the norm. You know somebody like that? You see him, wow, that guy's, he's a Christian, but there's something about him. I believe our pastor is that kind of a man. I really do. He lives above the rest. I've been with him for over 45 years. He's the same here as he is at home. The same man. Never compromise. Committed to God. Has been preaching the word of God for almost 50 years. How many other pastors do that? Committed to the word of God. And I praise God for him. Pray for him. That God will give him another 50 years to preach here. You know what I'm saying? I know he's listening to this message. Let's give him a little hint. But we need to see that. Look at me at 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want us to see this tremendous passage here. As Paul writes to Timothy, as Paul is trying to help Timothy... He writes this, and people who make that kind of commitment always want to live at the highest plane. Look at chapter uh, Timothy 6 and verse 11. 6 verse 11. And he tells Timothy, he tells Timothy, but flee from these things, you man of God. What a wonderful title. Timothy is called you man of God. And pursue righteousness godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good conscience in the pre- confession in the presence of many witnesses. But he says, Timothy, flee from anything that will defile you, if you would. Flee from those things that are going to hinder your ministry. Flee from anything that will put you in bad light in the world as far as your walk with God. 
whatever it is, put a hedge around you and don't do those things. As a minister, as a pastor, as a leader, as a Christian, we have to flee from things that will defile us. But fleeing from these things is not enough. We also have to turn and pursue what he says right here. And pursue righteousness. Pursue godliness. Pursue faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. We just can't run from things. We need to pursue those things that are right. And as we do that, as Timothy did that, Timothy is able to fill in the shoes, if you could, of the Apostle Paul. And he takes over, he takes the baton from Paul and he continues to minister as to where Paul soon is going to be killed for his faith in Christ. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Oftentimes we look at men like, like Daniel or David or Timothy or Paul and we say, man, I wish I could be that kind of man. You can. They serve the same God that we serve, amen? They were called by God. God has called us, we're his children. And God wants to use you and I today as he did these men. But right here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. Start with me in verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. And then he gives an analogy of a house, which I believe to be the church of God. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Friends, he gives an analogy of a house, like in your home. When you have someone come over your home that is dignified or a, or a pastor or, or someone that you have great respect for, you put out the, the best, the china. You put the broken place away and you show the best. Well, this is what this is. In a church, there are gold and silver vessels that are for honor. There are vessels that are wood and earthenware that are for dishonor. You know that in your house you have what's nice outside, you want everybody to see it, and then you have the garbage can that you hide in the corner somewhere. That's what this talking. I don't want to be a garbage pail. I don't want to be a garbage disposal. I want to be a vessel for honor of gold and silver. But the interesting thing is this. Look at verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set aside, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Is that your desire to be useful? Is that your desire to be gold and silver? Or are you satisfied with wood and earthenware just to be a garbage pail? You have the option. You can say, God, I want you to use me. I want to live for you. And so we see men like Daniel here that have a standard that is uncommon. They live above everything. I'm sure that when Daniel did his taxes, he didn't cheat on them. You know what I'm saying? You know, if, if you put this and this and this, you're going to get more money. Wow. I'm going to give five extra hundred dollars if I lie. See, that's a temptation. Fooey on that. You put what I tell you to put down when I make my taxes. The money it makes doesn't matter to me. But it's to do things. And when you live that way, your tax man begins to say, wow, what's, what's going on in your life? See, God opens doors for people that are bold, for people that have an uncommon standard. He opens doors because you're going to witness to people. You're going to share the good news. But those that are not walking as they should, there seems to never be someone to tell about the Lord. Well, there's nobody around. Look around you. The world is full of people who are lost and need the Lord. 
They're just above standard. And Daniel was that kind of man. He said, I'm not going to drink the wine or eat that food that's been offered to idols. Tell him to take a hike. I'm not going to do it. He was bold. He lived above the rest, even in his own group possibly. Because you don't hear from any of the other youths, but you do hear of Daniel and his three friends as taking a stand and as you read Daniel, you begin to see the, the, the difficulties they went through. They went through them, but God was with them. If God is for you, who can be against you, friend? If you're living for God, what can happen to you? I told Dr. Montoya, I said, you know, Dr. Montoya, we're preaching the word of God. You're preaching the word of God. They may take you to jail. And I'm going to have to go visit you at jail. He looked at me and he says, I don't think so. You're going to be in the cell next to me. You believe that? You know, we may all have to go to jail. If we can start a prison ministry, amen? Singing for the Lord in the jail, they won't want us around there. But you see, when you live with boldness, you're not ashamed. And you live above everyone else. You have an uncommon standard. Oh, friend, what a, what a wonderful testimony that is. Thirdly, I want us to consider that in verse 9, go back to Daniel. And this will be my last point here. Daniel 1 and verse 9. When a person is committed to God, when a person is sold out to God, and by the fact, you cannot make God second. He wants to be first. If you don't love him most of all, Nothing else matters. He wants your heart. He wants you to put him number one in your life. And when you live for him and you're sold out for him, we see right here that when a person is committed to God, he will have a protection that only God can give him. Look at verse 9 of Daniel 1. Now, first of all, in, in, in verse 8, we see that Daniel said no to those things that will defile him. So he seeks out permission. He just doesn't come down on the king. No, he, he's cordial. He's kind. And he says, sir, can you let the king know that I'm not going to eat that? It'll defile me. But then look what he says in verse 9. When he did that, now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. God moves in in favor of Daniel. Daniel is a godly man. Daniel wants to glorify God. Daniel wants to live for God. Daniel wants to proclaim God. And God is moving in him and strategizing his life as he will in our life. And he moves in and Daniel finds favor. It was God giving Daniel favor. Beloved, if you don't get anything else, get this. That God responds to this kind of commitment. God had brought Daniel into favor and compassion with a prince of the eunuchs. That's amazing, friends. That's amazing. Daniel didn't play politics to gain that. No. He didn't really think, well, I'm going to try to hee-haw or try to uh, wine and dine the, uh, the, the, the king. No. He didn't do that. He didn't play politics. Daniel was given that by God, who controls the heart. God controls the heart of the king. Where you work, you don't have to compromise to get that position, to get that raise. No. If God wants you there, guess what? You're going to get there. As you know, I worked for the city for over 29 years. And when I did, I just had to say, Lord, if you want me there. And before I went into my job, I said, Lord, if you want me in this position, you open the doors. If you don't close it, I don't want to be where you don't want me to be. I don't want to be a, have a job that's only for the money and the benefits. I want you to take my life and use me in that arena that I might be a testimony to those men and women. And you know, as, as I did that, I was able to see how God was able to open doors. 
an amazing thing. Oh, did they razz me? Of course they did. Did they make fun of me? Of course they did. But when things went wrong, guess who they went to? They sought me out. Not because I was special, but because they knew that I was a believer. And they checked me out to see if I was real. I didn't camouflage. I didn't blend in with the rest of the workers. Daniel stood aside from everyone else. He was different, and yet he was there in their midst. Okay. We can't run away and go up to the mountains and hide in some cabin, be monks. We're here. Amen? This is where God wants to use you and I. This is where God wants to take you and I and use us to share the good news, to live for him. And we can trust that God will protect us, that God will oversee what happens and what doesn't happen to our lives. So we can trust him for that. Now listen. If you and I are to have this protection, if we compromise, we're really saying, Lord, I don't need you. We're not obedient to him, Lord, I don't need you. But as long as we're doing this, we have this protection that only God can give us. That only God can give us. And you ought not be afraid to live your life for Jesus Christ. You ought not be afraid to share the, God, the good news with your family. You ought not be afraid to go to work and stand tall. You ought not be afraid to carry the Bible. You ought not be afraid of that. Wherever it is that you go to work. We need to trust God. And as we trust him, God will watch over us. I'd rather stand both face to the king and condemn his sin and have God on my side than to wiggle out of it and have the king on my side and God against me, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Definitely. Because God can control the heart of the king. And as you go to him, God places you where he wants you. As you go to him, God opens doors to minister as Daniel was able to minister in that pagan society. We live in a pagan world, friends. You know that is spiraling downhill more than ever before, more than in my own lifetime. It's in our face. It's on the TV. It's on the radio. It's in the universities. It's everywhere. And yet God has us here at this time, at this moment of history. These are exciting days to be alive, friends, because God can use us. These are exciting days not to be ashamed, to have boldness, to live an uncommon standard, to live above, to know that if I go out there and I'm preaching the word of God, God is with me and God will protect me. And many things happen, it is God allowed it, if you would. I've heard of this man from another church. He was part of their youth group. Excited for the Lord. Bold for the Lord. He will go out every, every Saturday and proclaim the word of God in his area. And one Saturday, I believe he went to downtown L.A. to preach the word, to give out tracts. You know that somebody... Beat him up and killed, killed that man, killed that young man. Do you think God made a mistake? That young man left a legacy. He left a legacy, and the youth in that church blossomed because this man had taken a stand. There is a cost sometimes, but God is with us, friends. But God is with us. So I want you to see and to understand that you and I need to be, first of all, have an unashamed boldness. Daniel had that. We need to have a standard above others. You don't live like the rest of the world. You don't even live like the rest of Christians if they're not right with God. You live above. You're different. That's the kind of man, the kind of woman, the kind of young person that God uses that's not ashamed. And when you're committed to God, you know that God is with you. When God is with you. 
When I just got saved, I remember I was excited, and I still am, for the Lord. I took the WIND program, evangelism program. And our church was in East L.A., the Holy Land, we used to call it. Michigan Engaged. It's no longer there. And I had just um, taken the, the program. And I remember that I had to go make a visitation. And in East L.A., there was a lot of gangs, you know what I'm saying? East Los and Maravilla and Garrity and on and on it goes. I was never part of the gang, okay? I may look like I was a gangbanger, but I wasn't. And I remember they gave me some, a card to go make an invitation. And I went there with my partner, two of them. They send you out two by twos. And I remember going to this place way up there where I knew it was Garrity territory. And it was going up some stairs stairs way up. It was dark up there. And I said, Lord, what happens if they recognize me and something happens to me? Maybe if I just leave the track on the mailbox, you know, and go away. <laughs> That's how wishy-washy I got, I'm telling you. Really, that was, I, I was wishy-washy back then. And then the Lord reminded me, wait a minute, I'm with you. You're not alone. And so I took that track and I went up there knocked on the door, and left the information there. To me, that was a wonderful thing. I learned to trust God. I learned to trust God. Lord, you're with me. And we need to live that way. You can't live in fear. Daniel went into Babylon never in fear. Daniel lived under pressure, but never gave in. Daniel was continually Continually harassed, but never compromised. And so God took Daniel for almost 80 years of his life and moved him up the ladder, second in command. And Daniel honored God. And let me say this. In all of his time in Babylon, in that pagan world, in that ancient Hollywood, Daniel never, never, not a one time, did he compromise? See, God takes that kind of person, friends. And I pray that as we come to the end, that we will examine our lives. And we'll say, Lord, I want to be that kind of man. I want to have that kind of boldness. I want to live above a, a cut above the rest. Father, I want to know that you're with me, so I will not fear. When you go back to the university, some of you will be secular, not to be afraid of of talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I need to see that he had an uncompromising life and an unblemished faith. Unblemished. Daniel really believed that God will make this possible. And that's where he got his confidence, by trusting God. This virus have given, has given a lot of people real fear, you know. But God is with us, friends. You do what you're supposed to do, and we leave the rest up to the Lord. Amen? We leave up to him. And we're trusting God, and we're asking God to, to move and to help churches get back on track again, to have services. We need the word of God. We need to come together as his body. We need the fellowship. Even of seeing each other is encouraging. You know that? It really is. And so I pray that as you come to the end of this year and you sit back and you make some look at your life and look at the year to come, that you would sit down and say, Lord, this is the way I want to live. I'm tired of living my life, a life that is not honoring to you. And so I want you to think about that. As we close in prayer, maybe there's one person here who would say, you know, I don't know the Lord. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You've never surrendered to him. If you were to die today, you would not know where you're going. But God died for your sin. In Romans chapter 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with a heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with a mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Oh, friend, give your life to the Lord. Acknowledge him. And go to him right there where you're at. And confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. I believe that's sincere and real. Trust in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word that is so true. For a man like Daniel. Oh, Father, such a young man who would not compromise. Who had purposed in his heart not to defile himself. Who stepped aside from the rest of society and lived. Though he was there in society, his life was different. Who had this boldness, who lived above the rest, and who trusted you knowing that you were overseeing his life. Help us to live for you. Help your church at this point in history to stand and run the race with more gusto. To speed up the pace, Father for your honor and for your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.